sorry for the delay. And actually, one of our speakers isn't here yet. And uh, that's Randy Jones from Holt and Everhart, which uh, he was instrumental in developing Fairview Village. Um, I know he will be here unless I go back to my office and find a voicemail that an emergency came up. But uh, we're going to switch the order, which is not ideal, because Randy was going to sort of tell you the story of Fairview Village and how it came about. And he will still do that when he arrives. And then secondly, Beth Wemple from Kittleson Associates was going to talk about how they did the traffic impact study um, for the village and what was innovative about that and sort of the, tra the transportation aspects of that. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to flip-flop a little bit. And I've asked Beth, we put the Fairview Village website um, up on the screen here. Uh, so we'll try to give you just a little background on Fairview Village. That, and then Randy, when he gets here, will give you more. And I'm going to turn it over to Beth. And again, a reminder, when you ask questions, you do need to use the microphone in front of you. OK, thank you. OK, well, I'm, <coughs> I'm Beth Wimple. And I'm a transportation planner and traffic engineer at Kittleson and & Associates, and we're a transportation planning and traffic engineering firm here in Portland. Um, I've been with the firm 10 years, and as it turns out, that's about how long ago Fairview Village um, was the ideas came to fruition and development started. Um, Fairview Village, so I'm, now I'm putting on my Randy Jones hat and telling you as much as I know about Fairview Village, and I'm sure he would tell you a whole lot more and it would be much better. But Fairview Village is located out um, in the community of Fairview, which is sort of close to Gresham. Uh, 223rd, Gleason, and Halsey are the streets bounding it. It's very near the Multnomah Greyhound Park, which is right across the street. And the idea around Fairview Village was to build a village or a community around the neo-traditional concepts that the urban design concepts that put the garages in back, build um, alleys, mixed-use housing where retail's on the bottom and smaller, develop, um, smaller homes are on top, um, build things within walking distance of each other so that ideally you wouldn't have to get in your car for so many trips, um, do lots of urban design things that we believe create community. Porches at the front of the house, um, a mix of design type so that it's not uniform and boring and so that the streetscape is inviting to, to um, residents. So this little map is the site map for Fairview Village and these are uh, the main streets surrounding it and then you, you come into the village and one of the things from a, a transportation perspective that was unique about the village is when the developers were planning the layout of the community and where the roads go, the idea was to not have them be big racetracks through the community, that they would be um, curvilinear, that there wouldn't be a straight shot from, from this road down here up to this road up here. So you can sort of make out that if I'm going to travel up here, I've got to make a couple of turns and come up here. So it's... Um, the, the idea is to create connectivity without creating cut through traffic. So um, now I'm putting on my traffic engineer hat. Randy Jones would have told you a whole lot more. But um, 1994, the, um, Holt and Ha, the company that developed the site, had their ideas together enough and enough political support and financial support to go ahead and submit a development application to, to the city. And that's where Kittleson came in. And we, we were asked to do the traffic study. And um, actually, let me take a, just a quick step back and tell you, since the information is here, show you some of the design features. One of the things about the community is the, the community um, focal points were developed and built right at the outset. So, and they were built at one of the major intersections of the community so that when you're traveling or walking around in the community, it's very obvious you're in a place. There's City Hall. It's very attractive. The post office was opened and built right away. The library is very attractive. And just some of the different features. Valleys went in. Um, the Main Street mixed use is, is similar to Aranko Station, if you've been out there, where um, coffee shops, little restaurants, little boutique stores. Um, in the late 90s, Target did go in. Um, 
The main missing element at this point is, well, in my opinion, is a grocery store. And that's been something difficult for the developers to get out there for many years. The number of people is just isn't big enough. The market area isn't big enough yet for a grocery store. And then there's a variety of housing types. There's some fairly traditional single-family homes, row houses, um, different kinds of things. All the streets have been designed with parking on the street, um, sidewalks, lots of street landscaping, etc. So when all of this came about and Kittleson was invited to, to help analyze the transportation impacts, that's where I came um, into play. And so typically what we do is, you know, it's the four steps in, in transportation planning, trip generation, trip distribution, trip assignment, and then the analysis. And the reason I have the site plan up there is even at Fairview, that step was different. For most developments, the civil engineers have got the site all worked out before it's even given to the transportation planner. And so at that point, we can't give advice about um, orientation of the buildings to the street. I mean, we can give advice, it's just not always taken, um, about the orientation of the buildings to the street, relationship of, relationship of parking to the street, access to and from the parking, pedestrian and bicycle access. Well, at Fairview Village, the, uh, they came to us and said, help us lay this out. Use your best judgment to give us this neo-traditional design. And that's where the curvilinear street plan um, came into play. Um, subsequent to that, in a typical study, we'll do trip generation where we just make an estimate of how many vehicle trips will be generated by the site. Trip distribution is where they will go. Are they going to go north, south, east, west, and how many go which way? Trip assignment is just making assumptions about the routes they'll take. When they are going north, what roads are they traveling on? And then the analysis is, from a capacity perspective, um, what what are the impacts of those vehicle trips on the roadway system? And I emphasize the words capacity and vehicle trips because often it is just limited to that, um, unfortunately. But at Fairview Village, it was broadened to include all modes of transportation, which was a treat for us. Um, so Fairview Village differed most significantly at the trip generation step. And that's what I'm going to talk mostly about today. Um, Typically, when we do trip generation, and uh, since I'm an engineer and a planner, I can use tables like these. But um, typically, we go to, there's a book. It's called the ITE Trip Generation Manual, uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers. And it says for any land use, almost any land use you can imagine, how many trips that land use will generate as a function of employees or square footage, um, beds, gas pumps, you name it. And these are based on empirical data that traffic engineers have submitted to ITE. And almost, almost ex exclusively, the studies, not a, the studies were largely done in the 60s and 70s. And almost exclusively, they were done at suburban developments where most people drive to and from the development. So there's a bias built in that these are going to be the vehicle trips. The problem we had is out in Fairview, we, we weren't designing your typical suburban development. So we all believed ITE didn't apply. And we had to come up with a methodology for um, estimating chip generation of the development. And we, you know, we're faced with that challenge yet today. So why was Fairview dif different? I touched on it previously. But mixing the residential, commercial, and retail uses right close together makes it different. Um, making it possible for people to walk or take a short bike trip from home to any of the errands that people do during the day or on the weekends. Um, the street plan, as I mentioned before, was designed with connectivity in mind. And so, you know, if you wanted to go um, from point A to point B, there was a fairly direct route to get there. It wasn't going to be a super long block with no interruption. Um, and then the streets were designed for low speed, so that if you did decide to walk or ride your bike, you were in an environment where the car wasn't dominating. So the streets were narrower, they were curvilinear, they are narrower, they are curvilinear. And it's just a little bit more comfortable to be a pedestrian walking on streets like that. Um, and then urban design plays a big, big role in it. What do the streets look like? Are there trees? Are there, you know, are the lampposts at, 
at a level that make it comfortable for me at nighttime. Um, and then the, the built environment that I'm walking next to, is that attractive? And are there windows? And does it feel like people are going to see me if I'm out here? And something unfortunately goes wrong. So we all recognized it was different, but had, had to um, do some work around what we were going to do about it. So one of the first things we did was decided, let's, let's subdivide trips by mode. We're trying to build a place where people walk. Um, let's find out what it, what's typical walking and, uh, or travel by each mode. And then what do we think would happen here at, at Fairview? So what's typical is, um, is over here. And uh, let's see. You can see that. Um, so this purplish color that stays purple up there is driving, driving, driving passenger, and then transit and walk bike. And at the time we were doing this study, Lutrac, um, which is a, a study about the Western Bypass and trying to avoid building it and instead building compact urban development, had just finished. And so they had a lot of modeling information about trip making characteristics and mixed use developments. At that time, that was the best available data. So we relied quite heavily on Lutrac. And what Lutrac had found is that um, by mode, driver trips would decrease in a mixed use development. Passenger trips would stay about the same. Transit trips would go up only slightly, but that walking and biking trips would go up. So our first step was to, of the trips that we were going to generate, lop off those that were no longer made in cars. And the figure was about 23%. The next step was to subdivide the trips by purpose. And we, we were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not guessing, but we were theorizing. It's a stronger word for guessing. Um, <laughs> what that the, the by trip type, so trips to and from home, versus non-home-based trips, um, trips from one's office or trips, uh, um, uh, delivery trips, things such as that, that those would decrease as a function of our mixed-use development. And again, working with some of the track data, we came up with these estimates where um, for, let's see, i got to get my mind around this again. For home-based trips, you'd see about a 23, another 23% reduction. Non-home-based trips, you'd only see about a 10% reduction for mixed-use developments. So when we um, brought those two things together, trip type and by mode, we were able to get an estimate of the reduction that we might see at Fairview um, with built in that mixed-use nature. And so in a daily uh, environment, a typical suburban development like Fairview might generate, this is around 17,500. And um, Fairview would generate around 16,200. So a 1,300 reduction in the daily, which at that level isn't really that much, all things considered. It is a reduction, and that's good, but it's not a lot. But when you look at the PM peak, which is the thing that matters from a congestion perspective, um, we saw, a, we were forecasting anyway, a pretty big reduction. It would go from, oh, about 1,800 to about 1,600. And so when, when I had the numbers at my desk, it was around a 300 trip reduction. That's a pretty big benefit in the PM peak hour. Just as a, as a rule of thumb, that can be effectively one lane at an intersection. Um, uh, just for clarification, are these just trips internal to Fairview Village, or are these all trips generated? These are the vehicle trips leaving Fairview. Yeah. Um, so that was what we did at Fairview. And, and Jennifer, so you know, this is my second to last slide. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> since then, uh, there have been some innovations, but not a lot. Um, ITE at that time didn't have a methodology, sort of a standard methodology for estimating trip internalization, which is what you were getting at. There's a, there's a concept anyway that if you, one develops a large mixed-use development, 
some of the trips are going to stay on the property. And so the exercise that ITE has developed is a way to estimate, OK, how many will stay on the property. And it, there's a relationship that um, is created between residential, commercial, and retail. And there's been some studies in Florida about how much, how many trips are attracted to and from those different uses. And so it gives you a way of estimating how many trips would stay on site. On the projects I've worked on recently, it, it's usually not as many as we would hope. Um, it's usually on the order of 5 or 6 percent altogether. So it's a reduction, but it's not a big reduction. And the challenge that developers have is getting enough retail on the site um, to support more internal trips, those trips during the day for folks working to and from lunch and the dry cleaner and all those little chores and things we like to do at lunchtime, but also for folks that live there providing enough services on the pro property that they don't need to leave the property for those errands. And that's hardware stores, post offices, grocery stores, all those things. Um, so unfortunately, it's the data so far is showing that there's not much of a market um, for that type of internalization. And then um, under the assumption that Jennifer was going to talk about <laughs> that we are, we've collected more data at different developments, so we're able to have more empirical data to feed back into the trip generation process. Since some of these developments have been built, we're able to start doing that. So. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Do you know if when they're um, doing the design for something like Fairview Village, whether they could take into account how many people or how dense it would need to be to be able to support a grocery store or just more retail in general yeah. and try and make it work on the front end? They, they can, and they try to. Um, the, the, the challenge comes to making the numbers work, the cost of building the homes and then attracting, building enough homes to attract a developer to come. And a lot of times, they just can't afford to get, get that high. I'm working on a development with a desire. They have a desire to be mixed use. And they're building on the order of 1,200 homes and still having a hard time justifying or encouraging a developer to come with a grocery store or some kind of retail. With your new figures um, about how people in Fairview would probably use less auto trips than a more um, traditional subdivision, were you able to get the developers to um, have fewer parking spaces, as in less pervious, impervious surfaces, because you had yeah. some statistics about how less people I, would be You know, I don't know. Um, that's a hard one. At Fairview, and I am pretty sure that they built less, they were building, building a lower number of parking than people were originally comfortable with. Um, and I know that there is, there's a debate in the community now about whether there's enough parking in the community. And one of the problems is people have an expectation that, or they have a desire to be able to park really close to wherever it is their destination is, if it's the coffee shop or their own home. And there's a sense out there anyway that if you have to park a half a block away, that's too far. So there's, there's also sort of the urban um, perspective that has to be educated into the residents that if you're going to live in a dense environment, you may not be able to park immediately in front of your door. Um, so I know that that's been a challenge in the community has sort of been thinking about what do they need to do about it. They haven't taken any action yet. I do know for other mixed-use developments around town, like the Round is one that's um, under, finally under construction again. That's the Round at Beaverton Central. Um, to get, excuse me, to get the level of office space in, there's just a minimum that developers want. And you can imagine that the round at Beaverton Central, if you're familiar with it, is right on a transit stop. I mean, you can't get any closer. And yet, the developer is still pushed to build um, a level of parking that, that is higher than we want, partially from the financial community to, to make the office make sense, but also from city code. You know, code has these minimums. and. We were trying to go under the minimums, and so we had to do some special conditions 
so that we could go lower than the minimums and then provide proof later that we don't need to pr build more. So it's a challenge from both ends. Yeah. Um, I just saw a presentation yesterday about lead certification and the uh, development that, you know, uh, the designers wished that the, the re request for lead certification would have been given to them earlier so they could have used that as a structure. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was interesting you said that they gave you the, uh, the you know, the object or the uh, requested that you uh, start laying out the plan before they planned all their things. Yeah. And um, do you feel that uh, that there um, there were considerations in there, uh, not just to do it first, but to to do it in a way that makes oh, yeah. makes it uh, uh, less demanding for the automobile. And then, kind of a additional question to that is: Were there any t topographical Issues as well as the yeah. through traffic question yeah, you had to good. deal with. The, um, they were definitely uh, interested in having our opinions about how to make it avoid the cut through traffic, and um, it was wise. I mean, uh, these are super busy streets, and so you can imagine folks would cut through. Um, so it was very a very um, proactive step they took. They said, "Well, let's minimize it." In terms of topography, and, and not a lot of developers do that. Um, I can think of a handful where we've gotten to do it, and you know that's in, in ten years at Kittleson. Um, topography, it's basically flat, although there's a um, big wetland here that they've had to regularly um, pay attention to as they've been developing the site, and that came into play. Um, this right here is Target. And there was a lot of um, worry when Target was being constructed about its parking lot and the fact that some of the wetlands had to be um, taken up to get the parking level that Target needed. And so they uh, made a distinct effort to you know, uh, do, the, do more than just the mitigation to actually um, enhance. So does that answer your question? Well, um, you, you did say that uh, they were trying to cut uh, reduce cut through traffic uh -huh. as one main goal of them giving it to you up front. Uh -huh. But did they also ask you, um, and please make sure that it's walking friendly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, we knew the desire was let's make it pedestrian friendly and let's minimize the impact of the vehicle. And so it was those two things were what we were striving for. Yeah. What's a transit service like there, and were there any? Um, recommended changes or enhancements to transit service incorporated in the plan? That's a, uh, that's a good question. The, the transit service is just bus service and I don't, maybe, do you, do you know if it? I don't remember the line number, but there is a line that runs up on the north side on the, co what, what road is that on the Costco? Halsey. On the target side, yeah. Yeah. And that was just increased maybe line 12. It was just increased um, in the, a year ago in terms of service hours, but it doesn't have a real high ridership because you start getting out that way um, and the, the density of the residential to the north is pretty low and it drops off real quickly as you go out, although there are some high density housing units out further. Yeah, yeah. But no light rail. And that's always been a, <laughs> when you talk about these mixed-use developments, um, I mean, we've all been thinking about them and looking at them around the region. Uh, the heart of Aranko Station is maybe a quarter of a mile away from light rail. Be uh, the round at Beaverton Central light rail goes right through it. And here there's no light rail. Now, light rail isn't the only thing that can make something transit-oriented, but we haven't quite had the ideal situation where they've all come together just yet. Lynn. Beth, what do you see as the data needs to be able to do this better or to have, you know, to feel more less like you're theorizing and more oh. towards, yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, yeah, we have some real solid numbers under our belt. Yeah, I mean, I think some of Jennifer's work that uh, she's done out there is the kind of stuff where we have actual data, survey data from the folks living there. Um, finding out what their trip-making characteristics are like, what mode they're traveling by. I mean, the questions are, what, what modes and are they making fewer trips? And um, 
and then tr by trip purpose, what is their mode of transportation? And then you can start using that for other developments. Um, and, and do they stay on site? Do they leave the property? All those uh, variables. So we need, just, we need survey data for sure. Uh, could you clarify a little bit? You had a graph that was showing that in the mixed-use development, you were having uh, slightly less people using in non-home trips than normal developments when you might think that in a neo-traditional mixed-use development, the non-home trips would be reduced more than the home-based trips on the assumption that once they get there, they might walk around to multiple locations as opposed to driving. Rephrase it? I mean, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you drive someplace and you then you're going to sit in your mixed-use development and you might go to multiple places. So you would think that the non-home-based trips would show a bigger decrease than the, the home-based trips. Home trips. Or if not bigger, then at least comparable, as, instead of just showing a very small decrease. The part of that comes from the non-home-based trip trips were all of the assumed commercial on the property. And at the time, there was a lot of commercial assumed for the property. To the extent that more, they were attracting more trips into the property than generated by the property. So, that, so there's the assumption of the just the 10 percent reduction comes from the fact that we were attracting more, we were sucking trips into this into our location. Question about um, if you could maybe get to the map, that'd be that'd be helpful. But um, I noticed that in a lot of uh, suburban locations, uh, the uh, development design there is you got the major uh, like so country farm roads from the old days around the outside, and the farmland in the middle got subdivided and built up. So the major streets you have around the outside were more than likely old country roads, mm -hmm. um, or if not in this development, in most suburban developments. Um, usually, uh, intersections in, you know, are destinations. That's where everybody goes. And, and as cities sort of grew, the intersection was the place to be. That's where everybody was crossing. Um, today, we see intersections as, as scary places where there's giant stoplights and lots of traffic. Um, is there any reason why? I mean, maybe because you didn't own the property on all four <laughs> sides of the intersection. Uh -huh. That might have been the biggest uh, problem. But why the... Uh, Commercial areas weren't set uh, either at an intersection or at least along the major street, so that transit could have been more convenient yeah. for the dense population. Because it seems here the dense population is in the middle of the development, and you have to walk a mile to get to the to the bus stop. Yeah, <laughs> it probably does feel like you have to walk quite a ways. There is, um, I don't know. I, I just think partially they didn't own the property um, across the street um, within the development. They they did, and it's, let's see, I think it's right around number seven. Uh, um, but right around number seven, where it's, that's kind of a node in the community where they, the, there's one intersection, and I don't know if it's at seven, where from there you can get to a lot of the retail that does exist, and then also you can see the post office and the library and the, and the city hall. So it does within the development it feels like a ma very major place but um, it doesn't relate at all to the surrounding system because it seems as with by uh, uh, accepting the fact that you're going to leave those giant major streets the development will always be a place to go past not to s slow down and stop at if they would have focused the development on the major street and, right. and made it a, the destination and so right slowed down the through traffic and made that the place to end up right not to, not to go past right um, right not only would it have been better for the, the transit users, because you would have been close to that major street where the, where the bus is going to be, but also um, you know, would have discouraged you know, uh, 
through traffic right. going farther and farther to the next suburb or something. Right, right. Is not possible with the developers uh, pro forma there? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I wish Randy were here to answer that. Yeah. Um, maybe you can answer this, maybe you can't. And I'm sorry for my voice quality here, but I noticed the elementary school number four is built on the lower left hand corner of the property across <laughs> the wetlands. <laughs> and, and all the kids who are theoretically going to school are on the uh, east side of that, I think it, that would be. So what provision have you given for foot traffic and bicycle traffic to elementary school? Well, I'm hoping there's a path. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Across from number one, there's a park. So directly from there, directly to the school. And bordering that whole wetlands area, there's also a walking trail. Do you know if kids from outside of Fairview go to that yeah, elementary school? Class. That may have. Yes. I think it might, yes. So if the community went in and built the path, then the question is that the developers didn't do it? Well, and, I, and why? I developer has been very supportive of getting people to walk throughout this community and that was one of their goals in the whole idea and so they were behind it but it was also sort of a neat thing for the community as a community building sort of exercise um, that they were involved with sort of cute little covered bridge So could I ask another question on that? It, it, what, it, what, it, what effect would moving number four to number one or number seven have on the vehicle trips in that subdivision? It entirely depends. I mean, I'm sure you understand this, but entirely, I don't know how many people drive to the elementary school. And so if it's, yeah, I, I just don't know. I don't know. If, Jennifer, if you have a sense for that, or anyone that has been there. Um, I worked with Jennifer on the survey of the of the village, and part of our survey asked kids directly how they got to school and of course a lot of people chose not to have their kids answer the survey so we have a very small <laughs> sample size but at this point um, and we didn't necessarily always distinguish between if they were going to that grade school or if they were maybe in middle school or maybe in high school but at this point it looks like about 75 percent of the kids going to school get there via an auto trip hmm. really Uh-huh. Do you know what a tip does anyone know what a typical elementary school might be? It's a good it's a good study to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you would think just that crossing having your kids cross through a swamp to get to school wouldn't exactly be the safest way to do it, so I would expect at least for this this plan, a lot of the parents would drive their kids. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't let my kid cross through a swamp to get to school every day. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I can, re res res yeah, I've actually walked from um, the city hall to both the Target and the school, and it's not quite a swamp, so I mean, it's <laughs> it's more of a woodland, but that's a whole other issue of, you know, letting your kids walk through the yeah. you know, woods at you know, in the morning. Yeah. I think the village is holding out some sort of I don't know. So it's I don't know if we can necessarily fault the developers the way we do on that. I'm not sure that they have the When you were doing the trip generation estimates, um, did you take into account the uh, demographics of future, you know, possible residents in that whole area? Not directly. 
I'm thinking because uh, things like income, education level, you know, and so on may have some, uh, you know, impact on the future uh, trips generated in yeah, the whole area. Yeah, as well as age. We were talking a few minutes ago that it seems like there's a lot of older folks living there. Um, it does, and um, in this study we didn't, and that, it, that's pretty typical. Most studies rely on that the empirical data to um, estimate the trip rate. And so that takes all the income and, and demographics out of it. In a bigger travel demand model, that's, that type of information is definitely, definitely considered. What were the, uh, the cross-sections of the streets throughout the development based on in terms of widths of sidewalks and the street area and what you put along sidewalks and streets? Like, did you find anything or? Well, um, you know, it was as narrow as we can get. And I'm trying to remember how we involved the fire department. And at the moment, I'm, I'm blanking on that. Um, I could look into it further. If if you're really curious, but I don't have an answer right now. <laughs> Are there more questions for Ben? I want to fo follow up to John's question. Uh, so that main road that you were talking about that goes right there from 10 to 12 to through the middle there, uh -huh. is that main road um, a one-way each direction, or is it you know, two-lane each direction? Does it have a median? <laughs> no, is it no. bike lanes on it? Is it the major artillery? It's, it's one it? lane in each direction um, on street parking. I don't think there's striped bike lanes. No. And well, I think it's much, I mean, it's comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Are there additional questions for Beth? Okay. I don't know if you know, but I was curious as to what, and maybe you know for, but what, what was at the site before all this development? I think it was... I don't know. Do you know? And what is Fairview? Why is Fairview a municipality? <laughs> <laughs> it's tiny. It is tiny. Well, the Fairview Village is a part of the municipality of Fairview. It was. And it, that is tiny, you're right. Built on land previously owned by Tektronix Corporation. Um, 95 acre site. Uh, I guess Tektronix didn't end up moving. Yeah. yeah. Didn't they move out? Of Gresham or close down? <laughs> uh, that was uh, Okay, so I will, um, I'll give you a little preview of two weeks from now's seminar. I hope I don't steal my own thunder too much. So um, I had, you know, gotten here and I met Beth and I heard about this Fairview Village and uh, apparently. Um, the developer, in particular Randy Jones, was very interested in finding out, you know, what was really going on. They had developed this pretty innovative new urbanist community, trying to promote some walking, et cetera. And so I went out and met with Randy, and he, t you know, gave me a little tour of the village. And I thought, oh, this would be pretty cool to sort of find out what is going on. And so I... Um, I should give a little plug, PSU, I got a small grant from PSU to do some research on this. And um, I involved a couple of my students, Mike Rose and Matt Lauer, who are back there, helped out on this. And since I don't have anything, my PowerPoint, which you'll see in two weeks, what I will show you, this by the way, we'll see a bigger picture, but there's a picture up there, a fair view that Matt took. So we did a survey, and we surveyed folks at Fairview Village, and we surveyed um, households in two other developments in Troutdale, which is within a few miles, uh, suburban style, your more typical subdivisions that were um, only single family homes. One of them had a, sort of a Safeway, strip mall style shopping center within walking distance of most of the households. Uh, the other one did not have shopping within a quarter mile walking distance, but had some parks within walking distance. So we did some surveys of the neighborhoods. Let me show you. This is in black and white in here. This is the uh, 
it's not called Main Street, it's called Road Street or Market, Market, Market Street, I think, where there is uh, small retail on the bottom here and housing above, and you can actually buy those units. Um, you buy the whole unit so you could live above your own shop if you wanted to. Uh, and so I don't want to tell you everything because I'm going to present all of this in two weeks from now, but I'll give you a little sneak preview of some of the stuff. And in particularly, since Beth focused on the trip stuff, what we asked the, we had surveys for the adults in the household and for the kids in the household. And we asked them for the previous week how many trips they made from home to different types of locations by mode. So for example, if they drove to work five days, Monday through Friday, the previous week, they would put a five under vehicle trips to work. If they walked to the library once, they would put that down as a one. Uh, so and we, this was gathered on the person level. And so these are some of the results when, um, of Fairview Village compared to our control neighborhoods. And the lines that are in bold are ones that there's a statistically significant difference in the average number of trips by mode, by purpose, between these two groups, Fairview Village versus our control neighborhoods. Um, one, the first line up here uh, number of personal vehicle trips, there was a, a difference. The folks in the control neighborhoods per person, per adult, made an average of uh, over 14, almost 15 personal vehicle trips the previous week um, compared to the Fairview Village. Now these are just trips from home. So that's why the numbers, for those of you who look at trip generation type numbers, uh, it may seem a little low because we didn't count the trip coming back home or the trip made from their work to the store or whatever. We were just curious about from home to various locations. Um, no big, no statistic, well, almost statistically significant difference in bike trips, but the walking trips is where you see the huge difference. So the adults in Fairview Village, on average the previous week, made over six and a half walking trips from home for various purposes. And in the control neighborhoods, it was 1.66 trips, which is a very large difference. Transit trips, there was no difference. Um, and as we've already talked about, there isn't um, a high level of transit service there. Total trips reported, the folks in Fairview Village actually make more total trips. And you can sort of guess, you can see part of that is because they're making more walking trips. In terms of why or where they're walking, a couple of things. I, the, for example, down here, walk trips to restaurants, cafes, a big difference uh, between the Fairview Village folks and the control neighborhoods. I mean, basically, there aren't any restaurants for the other folks to walk to that are really within very close walking distance. Uh, but there were. You can also see down here walk trips for recreation. So that would be if I'm just going to take a walk around in my neighborhood, which you don't have to have a destination for. It's just getting out and walking. And even there, you can see at the very bottom, there was a big difference, almost a difference of one trip um, between the control neighborhoods and Fairview Village. We also, um, and also a big difference in terms of walking to the park, and the other neighborhoods did have parks that were accessible. So there were, and things like the post office, there's a post office right in Fairview Village. There isn't a post office within walking distance of the other neighborhoods. Um, so there's obviously a big difference there. I mean, part of uh, this is telling you, well, the other folks couldn't walk to a post office because it was too far away. And that's true. They couldn't. But on the positive side, if you want to look at the glass half full, the folks in Fairview Village were provided with an opportunity to walk to a post office, and some of them are walking to the post office. Uh, so given that opportunity, they are taking advantage of it, I guess would be sort of the bottom line. Um, we also asked some questions whether or not they were walking more in this neighborhood than where they used to live. And more than half of everyone in all the neighborhoods says, yes, I'm walking more than where I used to live. The folks in the control neighborhoods were more likely to say, I'm walking more because I want to improve my health, or I've got a dog, or some reason like that, 
the folks in Fairview Village were more likely to say, I'm walking more because there's places to walk to. So they were given that opportunity and they're exercising that desire. Janelle? Did you do any um, like quality of life studies between how they felt walking in this community compared to their old community? Uh, we asked a series of questions about how they liked their neighborhood and whether they knew their neighbors, whether their neighbors knew them, sort of a lot of sense of community. And I don't want to uh, tell you everything because I want to save something for uh, two weeks from now. But in general, uh, people in these neighborhoods were equally happy with where they were living. And part of that had to do with what they wanted out of a neighborhood. And there are some differences demographically between the two neighborhoods. There are fewer families with kids in Fairview Village than in the other neighborhoods, for example. So, Paul. You may have mentioned this. What were your sample sizes for the? Uh, we delivered and or mailed a survey to every single housing unit in Fairview Village and Except, I should say, I think what we missed were if there were in-law units above the garages in the single-family homes. I realize we missed those. but And then all the housing units in the other. And so it turned out to be, uh, in terms of surveys received, so that took out vacant homes, for example, um, 290 in Fairview Village, 269 in the control neighborhoods, and we had 131 and 79. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I missed or not, but which were your control neighborhoods and how many did you use? Um, they were Cherry Ridge over here and Hampton Point over here. And I don't have pictures of those in here. If I spent some time, I could pull some up, but we'll save those for. They were uh, built at roughly the same time, single family homes of about the same price range and about the same square footage, though uh, Fairview Village has more smaller homes because they have attached townhomes that are smaller square footage than the single family homes. But they're pretty comparable uh, in terms of physically what they were. Just the main difference between the control neighborhoods and Fairview Village, the huge difference was the mix of land uses. They each had pretty narrow streets. Mike, were the streets, they were 26 feet or 24 or 28 feet? Do you have a microphone to use? We were surprised <laughs> because when you walk around Fairview Village, the streets themselves tend to feel a little bit narrower. But um, we went out there and, and Matt did the measuring and he said he, he kept looking at that tape measure and couldn't believe what he was seeing, but the street widths were the same in all three neighborhoods. One of the reasons the streets feel narrower in Fairview Village is because the houses are set much closer to the street. The, the front yards are very narrow. They're also slightly higher. If you walk around, you may not notice it at first, but the houses are a few feet above the street and part of that was the idea of the eyes on the street and the the developer planned it that way that wasn't an accident or it wasn't the topography um, they felt that if people felt a little higher then it was sort of okay to be closer to the street in terms of feeling safe by having a little bit of that height so um, I was trying to see if there's a good picture of that Well, that's probably that's not a very good picture, but um, yeah, that's one of the reasons that it feels closer in. The lots are smaller as well. I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened to Randy. I went and checked my voicemail. He didn't leave me a message, and I'm sorry. We've never had a speaker not show up, so this is a new winging it. So, okay. Thank you very much.